Take it away. Yes, it's the news with me, Joseph. <laughs> it's something that we're never going to do again. <laughs> okay, so, so we have a few things to go through today. Uh, it's been a pretty hectic week, maybe two weeks if you consider how we didn't have a show last week. Uh, I chose some of the things that I thought were the most interesting, although it was pretty hard, which is why I created a new bit called News Flash, where I where we don't really cover a news story, we just mention it, and then we poke fun of it, and then we move on, which is a really good way to do things, I think. I like and then that. We'll be talk- <laughs> and then we'll be talking about the California Senate candidate forum slash debate, uh, which occurred at the Feel, uh, the Burn Democratic uh, Club in LA, I believe. Yes. Uh, which was super interesting, and I want to go over that a little bit. I'll uh, we'll also be talking about how the California Net Neutrality Bill passed the Senate, Interesting. And then I also want to talk about how the fight for municipal internet in Pasadena is going on. And that's actually, that's actually a really interesting one, which I think you will all be really interested in. (laughs) (laughs) So for a lot on that. So newsflash. Yes. So we had a really hectic week this week. We had that state of the union, or as I like to call it, the shit show 2.0. A lot of shitty things followed by clapping, followed by more shitty things, followed by clapping and followed by clips of Joe Manchin trying to stand up and then Chuck Schumer staring him down. I don't know if any of you saw that clip, but it was pretty funny. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, kind of disappointed that he went, he mentioned the Russia thing during his response to the state of the union, but I guess that was what he had to do. So I won't be too hard on him because he was honestly the best guy who was talking that day because Joe Kennedy was drooling everywhere and that was not good. And I'm not and I'm not going to lie. I was disappointed. I was disappointed because when I heard that the Democrats had chosen a Joe to respond to the State of the Union, I thought they were talking about me. I was like, yes, they finally made a sane decision. And then someone was like, oh, it's Joe Kennedy. And I was like, who that? Who that? Who this Joe Kennedy? And they're like, he's a superstar. I'm like. Wait, this guy who's anti-marijuana, who's anti-Medicare for all, he's the superstar. And they're like, yeah, yeah, he might be, he might be Kennedy 2020. I'm like, please no, just no. And then, of course, we had that newness memo, which really wasn't much. It was just hyped and then just confirmed some of the things that we already had suspicions over. So nice going there, GOP dude. And then, of course, we found out this week that uh, Nancy Pelosi went on to the RuPaul Drag Race All-Stars show, which is exactly how you win elections. Who cares if you stand up for policies like Medicare for All and College for All? All we care about is whether or not you're going on RuPaul's show. This is not how you win elections, folks. Okay. Hilarious. <laughs> okay. Newsflash, done. <laughs> Moving I like on that, to- I like, the new, I like that new segment. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, moving on to the California uh, Senate Candidate Forum that the Field the Burn Democratic Club had hosted. Uh, it's basically their, their way of trying to choose who to endorse for the California Senate race. And you might notice that on that nice list of people, there's one name missing. Where's that fine sign? <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, she didn't go to something that was called Feel the Burn Club. Now, who who, had, who attended this? Well, Kevin DeLeon, the president pro, president pro tem in the California Senate right now. David Hildebrand, the lovely uh, Democratic Socialist, who we had on this show last last week to talk about health care, which is lovely. Uh, Allison Hartson, who is the Justice Democrat candidate running against Dianne Feinstein. And Pat Harris, who is a lawyer who you may not have heard of because not many people have, but he's another one of those progressive candidates who uh, is currently running as Feinstein. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to lie. I want to give you guys a a short summary about what happened here. I'm not going to lie. Kevin DeLeon was completely out of place in this one. And you might say, yeah, that makes sense. This guy has a super PAC and this guy is practically taking money from basically the same spots as Feinstein. So maybe... We shouldn't expect that much from him, but I do want to give him credit for coming because he looked super uncomfortable during the whole entire thing. There were moments where he was asked about money and politics, and he gave a very politician answer of saying, oh, I'm against dark money and all this. And then immediately following his answer, David Hildebrand was up next to answer the same exact question, and Hildebrand basically went after him by saying, hey, I'm against dark money too. I'm against this big money too. I'm also against super PACs which is something that one of the candidates here happened to have. So it was basically one of those situations where Kevin DeLeon was going there to look like a mild progressive in an area where 
progressivism is appreciated. <laughs> so giving him total credit, and in case you're wondering whether or not I'm exaggerating when I say it looked awkward, I want you guys to watch this clip of uh, well, that occurred, and it was basically one of the lightning rounds that they had going on. A lightning round is basically where the host would ask a question, a simple yes or no question, and the candidates on stage get to hold up a sign, a green sign for yes, a red sign for no, and they, Kevin DeLeon didn't necessarily do a good job of automatically answering the question. He might have been cheating a little bit. So let's take a look at that. Should the DNC eliminate unpledged superdelegates? Yeah. Yeah. Do you support the recall Rendon effort? What? Do you support the recall Rendon effort? Yeah. Anthony Rendon, the speaker. Do you support a nationwide ban on fracking? Was there any unusual influence by Russia in the 2016 general election? No. <laughs> Was there any unusual influence by the DNC in the 2016 primary? <laughs> Okay, are police officers unfairly avoiding culpability in officer-involved shootings? <laughs> what was that? The question was, are police officers unfairly avoiding culpability in officer-involved shootings? Peaking. He was peaking. Yes, he was peaking. And that's kind of the tone that the whole entire forum had for Kevin DeLeon. There were moments where he would be asked questions about oil and he was kind of cheat off of some of the answers that the other progressive candidates were giving. He would occasionally look over. And there are moments where he just was completely startled. For example, the moment where he was asked whether or not he was going to give uh, Ed, the money that he received from Ed Buck back to the victims of Ed Buck's, uh, he kind of was like, oh, uh, I, I totally will. As far as we are aware, he has yet to give that money back. And generally speaking, he did. He was the most politician of all of them uh, on stage, but he just wasn't handling it very well. And he, I guess he knew what he was getting into. So I do give him credit for actually coming to a place called Field the Burn with that more left centrist kind of view. Now, the other candidates, uh, the other three progressive candidates who do not have a suit back and who are running corporate free campaigns, uh, Alison Hartson was unfortunately the second most weakest in this forum debate. And this isn't to say that Alison Hartson is a bad candidate, by the way. This is more or less just judging debate forum performance in this case. Uh, Alison Hartson, she did have some strong moments where she was really going hard. She is a former Wolfpack person. So when it came to issues like money and politics, she was going hard at it. She was she had some great moments there. Uh, she was also one of the first candidates to mention single payer health care. But in turn, she was also weak when it came to single payer healthcare because she would have moments where she would come out and say, oh, I haven't actually read Bernie Sanders' bill, which really didn't look good when Pat Harris was specifically actually saying things like, oh, here are my specific improvements that I would actually put onto Bernie Sanders' bill because I don't necessarily agree with this and this and this. And David Hildebrand was just generally being consistent when it came to these issues. Now, uh, <clears throat> Pat Harris, who you might not know, a lawyer guy, but very, very strong when it, came to, when it comes to progressive issues and very strong when it comes to uh, debate formats in general, actually. I understand why he likes to do these events because he's very strong. He goes straight at it. He's he's somewhat of a straight shooter and he's he goes into the specifics of certain things. And then when there were questions asked where other candidates were answering before him, he would actually combine all those answers together and he would do a really good job of pushing this really progressive uh, message along. But the most consistent, the best performance in this forum and debate, I think, would go to David Hildebrand, simply because he was the most consistent one. He was really calling out Kevin DeLeon in the beginning and, you know, all of his somewhat BS answers. And he was generally just solid. He, there were moments where he did have hiccups, but generally solid, but generally very clear when it comes to where he stands on certain issues, while Hartson and... Uh, well, Harson wasn't as bad as Kevin DeLeon, but Kevin DeLeon would somewhat dance around the issue a little bit, which is why I think ultimately the field, the Burn Democratic Club, ended up giving the endorsement to David Hildebrand. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, but 
part of the reason why I wanted to cover this was just to mention David Hildebrand got this endorsement, California Senate race. But another thing that I do want to mention is that there are some left-wing media outlets that are really framing this Senate race as, oh, there's this one very viable progressive candidate, and then there's a bunch of these other splinter, uh, not not so viable progressive candidates that we really shouldn't look into. And then there are the Kevin DeLeon, uh, Diane Feinstein situation going on. Mm-hmm. That's not the case. There are three really good candidates here, Pat Harris, Allison Hartson, David Holderman, they're all running, they're all very progressive. And I understand that a lot of progressives on the left are a little worried here. They're going, A, maybe the progressive voice, uh, progressive vote, excuse me, might be uh, split between these three candidates. And I understand that concern. And if you can go and persuade one of them to drop out and maybe endorse the other, go do that. I doubt you can, though, because all three of these progressive candidates seem to be running really solid campaigns, and they seem to be running to win. So I say we make the best out of the situation since there are progressive candidates who are not taking corporate cash, who are for Medicare for all, who are for college for all, who are for raising the minimum wage, for who are all for these great progressive policies. Since we have this situation going, we should have town halls that are actually progressive. We should have we should be able to have debates between all these progressive candidates and see who is the most progressive, who deserves to actually represent this progressive state, California. That should be able to happen. And I think Uphill Media is willing to host some kind of debate or town hall here. So that's that's good. And, you know, I really hope that some of these left wing media outlets might actually change their behavior a little bit here and maybe go ahead and say, hey, we're going to actually host something, host something actually progressive, an actual progressive debate that only a progressive state like California can actually go through with. I hope that happens. I don't know if it will. Well, I hope so too. Thank you for that. That was a fascinating event, and we kind of watched it happen in real in real life. And so, thank you for for uh, synthesizing. It oh, and and by the way, uh, if you live in California, I encourage I encourage you to go watch uh, the full stream. You can find the quality isn't that great, but you can find one on Facebook. Mm-hmm. It's a really interesting. Uh, debate slash forum it'll help you learn more about the candidates i know some of you are going i like allison i like david i don't know which one to choose i don't know who to vote for this might be a good opportunity to become more informed about where each person stands and maybe make a decision on who to vote for although we do have some time before the california primaries cool yes we do but it's what 13 weeks it's It'll be fast. Yeah, it'll be fast. It'll be fast. Four, well, months, there'll, from, there'll be four more. months from tomorrow is the California primary. So oh. <laughs> what else is going on, Joseph? OK, so uh, this week we actually saw some good news on net neutrality. And that usually leads people to think, oh, he's going to talk about the CRA against the CRA. We got it, Joe. You like the CRA. No, no, not this time. This time we're actually going to be talking about one of the net neutrality stories that I did on my first show, the story about how in the California Senate, there is a net neutrality bill from Kevin DeLeon and Senator and State Senator uh, Scott Wiener. Now, in this case, Senator Kevin DeLeon's bill actually passed the Senate. And in case you guys forgot what, what, what was in the bill, let me read to you a bit from the Ars Technia article here. Uh, California may be the closest to passing such a legislation after yesterday's Senate approval of SB 460, a bill proposed by Senator Kevin DeLeon. The bill passed 21 to 12, with all 21 A's coming from Democrats. The bill is now moving to the state assembly where Democrats have a 53 to 25 majority over Republicans. The bill bill would prohibit, would prohibit home and mobile internet providers from blocking lawful content, applications, services, or non-harmful devices, except in cases of reasonable network management. Throttling would also be outlawed along with trade prioritization or providing preferential treatment of some internet traffic to any internet customer. More generally, the bill prohibits ISPs from interfering with a customer's ability to select, access, and use broadband internet access service or lawful internet co- lawful internet content, application services, or devices of the customer's choice, or an edge provider's ability to make lawful content applications, services, or devices available to a customer. ISPs would be prohibited would be forbidden from using deceptive or misleading marketing practices that misrepresents the treatment of the internet traffic or content to its customers. Or in other words, this is a bill that would really restore net neutrality in its full form. 
Now, this still has to pass the state assembly, so this this isn't something to be cheerful about yet. And if it is, if it passes the state assembly and actually becomes a law, it will definitely be challenged in law by the FCC. And unfortunately, if you, in my opinion, this bill is probably not going to be standing when it goes to court mainly because this bill directly goes after what the FCC did here by repealing net neutrality. And I don't think the, the federal court would actually look so kindly onto that. What might work is Senator Scott Wiener's bill that I mentioned earlier, which is a little less direct. It is more about, uh, it's more about an incentive. So ISPs cannot uh, go against net neutrality if they want to get contracts from uh, the government. And if they if they don't follow net neutrality rules, they won't be able to get it. So it's more of an incentive type law. But I feel like that one has a better chance in court. But we'll keep you guys updated on that. Interesting. Right I just want to say this with the with the uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you lost me on reading the law on Kevin's. And with the second <laughs> one, uh, the problem with that whole concept is that all you have to do is grease the right fingers, right? Yeah, so so it's not it's not perfect it's not perfect at all, but it is a step in the right direction. It is an incentive for something at least, and it's just one aspect of the net neutrality fight that's going to keep on going on. Very true. Yeah. So uh, going on from a story uh, about an update to what was going on to the net neutrality bill in California to a story about fighting for municipal internet in Pasadena. Which is super, which is a really interesting one that we have been teasing throughout the show. Uh, if you are watching your city council on Monday evening, like we all do on Monday evenings, we all love to watch those city council meetings. They're so monotone and great. Uh, if you are watching uh, the city, uh, city of Pasadena's uh, city council meeting on TV, you might have noticed that there was a familiar progressive YouTube face on there. The Jimmy Dore Show's own prog uh, progressive, Ron Polcone. Ron Placone, you may have seen him on TYT Nation. He does a thing there. Uh, you might have seen him on his own show, Get Your News On With Ron. But Ron Placone and a bunch of his fellow net neutrality supporting friends went to the city, city uh, went to the Pasadena City uh, Council meeting, and they basically made a case for getting municipal internet in Pasadena. So can we roll the clip for that? Uh, Ron Placone, followed by Jeffrey Jost, followed by Melissa, followed by Robert Ellison. Uh, good evening. My name is Ron Placone. I am a resident here in Pasadena. I work here and I vote here. I'm here to discuss the need for municipal internet in Pasadena, why it's essential now, and how it will benefit our community. Recently, the FCC repealed net neutrality. Despite not being cemented until 2015, rules of net neutrality were assumed since the advent of the internet as we know it. Without net neutrality, cable companies will now be allowed to create fast lanes and slow lanes for access, throttle different content depending on the power of its creator, and essentially turn the internet into cable television 2.0. Municipal internet ends this struggle once and for all, putting infrastructure in the hands of the public and out of the hands of corporate interests. I myself am an online content creator. I rely on a free and open internet for my livelihood. Given the wealth of creatives, college campuses, and tech industry here in Pasadena, I know that I am not alone. Other communities that have already made this investment, Chattanooga, Tennessee, Sandy, Oregon, Longmont, Colorado, they have the best internet in the country at a price that is lower than what most people pay for their internet. More importantly, Net neutrality and municipal internet is essential for the United States, and we can do our part by building our own right here in our own community. The time is now. Thank you for your time, and for everybody that took the time to join me today, howdy, howdy. So after Ron, Ron Placone spoke, uh, two council members actually expressed interest in getting municipal internet in there in Pasadena, and then after Ron Placone spoke, he was followed by four or five others who were also in support of municipal internet. And it was, of course, noticed by the city council who were not expecting so many people to be coming out and fighting to get municipal internet in Pasadena. In fact, it was such, in fact, the turnout for this thing was so great that 
people from outside of Pasadena actually came in to support Rumblecone too. One person actually said, hey, if you guys actually do this in Pasadena, I'm going to have to move here. Which is actually a far more legitimate point than I think people realize. Because I think some people hear that some cities got municipal internet and they're like, hey, maybe I should move there. That that sounds lovely. That sounds great. Municipal internet, it's cheaper. It's faster. I mean, everything's great about that. Mm-hmm. And now Ron Pacone from here, uh, according to Ron, he wants to find out what municipal internet will be. He, he, excuse me. He wants to find out when municipal internet will be added on the municipal agenda and then find out when it goes to committee. He, he has, of course, uh, listed the name of the two council members who said they were on board with his idea. So he plans to get in touch with them, put a bit of pressure on there and be like, hey, net neutrality is this big issue. I'll look at what happened in the California Senate recently. They recently passed that uh, net neutrality bill from Kevin DeLeon. He wants to do that. And then when uh, the city council meets up again, meets up again and when it goes to committee, uh, he wants to show up at the city council meeting with more people who are supporting municipal internet and basically try to pressure them to really go forward with the idea. Great. Now, uh, this isn't anything too specific yet. This is just the, getting the conversation started. But I think what Ron is doing here is really interesting. Uh, he himself is saying, hey, I'm going to document all of this. I'm going to try to see what we do right, what we do wrong. Maybe this could be an example for people who want to get municipal internet in their communities in the future. Uh, he's it, It's all a big experiment, basically, still. But I think this is a really interesting way to go. I think starting the conversation is really important here. And... Look, you might not be Ron Pocone. You might not have the platform that he has. Because part of the reason why Ron Pocone had that big uh, group of people coming out to support him was because he had a big platform. He has his own show, Get Your News On with Get Your News On with Ron. He goes he goes on the Jimmy Dore show. He's the producer of the Jimmy Dore show. But it doesn't have to be that big. If you're in your community and you want to start getting municipal internet in your in wherever you live and you want to start get the, getting the conversation going, I say reach out to some of your friends who are also understand the uh the the importance of net neutrality who understand the importance of getting municipal internet in and then also reach out to local progressive groups tell them hey i'm doing this on this specific day i'm gonna go talk to my city council it would be great if you guys could come on and support me too uh in ron pacone's case there were there uh in pasadena apparently there's like a pro uh there's like a tech company around which also came out to help him out and one of the people who was speaking at the city council was at the city council meeting was actually a programmer who was like i understand that this is really important i think municipal internet is like a right step in the right direction here and i think we'll be leading uh the rest of america into getting municipal internet so reach out tech companies progress local progressive groups to your friends and you can also do something similar you don't have to be ron placone here we we can just be one man and reach out to our fellow man (laughs) and uh just keep fighting for municipal internet. So uh, this is going to be really interesting. I hope we can eventually get Ron Placone on here. That would be super cool to talk about uh, how he, how his effort to get municipal internet is going and to talk about how others can also do the same. And yeah, Pasadena, we'll see how it goes. But it would be really cool if they eventually do get municipal internet going. I would love to have Ron Placone on the show. Ron, if you're listening, <laughs> you're invited anytime. Give us an update.